Good morning. Please open your Bibles with me to 1 Peter chapter 5. As we come to the month of December, I normally do a short series of sermons relating to the Incarnation, but this year, this month, will be a little different. Uh, we're going to keep going in 1 Peter 5, uh, and yet at the same time, uh, it's very complementary to Christmas sermons. And the reason why is that we're studying our humility as well as our exaltation. Our humility in bringing our hearts low and our exaltation as God lifts us up. And what is that if not an imitation? Indeed, it is an imitation of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. And what's the beginning of his humiliation? The beginning of his humiliation is his incarnation. We've just sung about uh, what child is this? who is being laid in a manger and is being born among animals. Well, it's God. Who is this child? That's God. Who, who is this child that is, that is nursing? It is God. Who is this child who is being pursued by human kings and his parents must flee to Egypt? It's God. Who is this little one with no place to call his own? It's God in the flesh. In the incarnation, we see humiliation. We see humility, a low state and a low condition. And why did God take on our flesh? It was to lift us up. It was to bring us to glory and exaltation. And he passed from humiliation to glory. And we in him will do the same. First, mortality and humility. And then immortality and glory. Let's read our text and then I'll introduce our outline. We're reading 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 5 through 7. Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another. For God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you. Casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. Now, a week ago, we pressed the pause button on our study of our exaltation, our lifting up, because we didn't have time to cover it all, and it's a, a subject that deserves every, every minute and every moment uh, that we can dedicate to it. So ever so briefly to remind you of what we have seen so far in our study of God's lifting up of his people is that in this life, there is a partial lifting up. There is a partial lifting up from our afflictions in this life, though it be neither promised nor guaranteed, yet God in his mercy and kindness is often uh, so loving to us that he lifts us up from our afflictions even here in this life. And so we must endure those afflictions humbly. And then we saw that while there is a partial lifting up in this life, uh, there is a complete lifting up at the end of this life. A complete lifting up. And we began to see that the complete lifting up of God's people at the end of this life is certain. It is perfect. It is final. And it is negative in a removal of all sin and sorrow and suffering, as we sang today, far as the curse is found. But it's also positive, not just in taking away what is evil and wicked and painful. It's positive in bringing us into a state of exaltation, a state of glory and perfection. And that's where we're picking up. What is that glory which we have not heretofore known? What is that glory? positive lifting up and exaltation that Christ's people will experience at the end of their life and at the end of this life. Well, that will be the subject and the center of this sermon in four, four points. Consider four things with me regarding the lifting up of Christ's people at the end of this life. In the first place, the perfection of the soul. The perfection of of the soul. As was stated last week, the soul that God has created for man consists of a mind or an intellect, same thing, mind, intellect, and the will. 
intellect and will. With the intellect, we understand. It's a faculty of understanding things. God has given to man the faculty of intellect. It's a faculty of the soul by which we understand. And he's also given to us the faculty of will, a power or a faculty by which we choose. We decide to act. We make decisions. And we said last week that in this life, that partial lift, there is a partial lifting up that is guaranteed. There is a partial lifting up that is a promise for Christ's people. And that is that God begins a work of grace in the soul. Through regeneration, through the second birth, the power of the resurrection impacts and penetrates the soul and begins to renew the mind or the intellect and renew the will. But that work of God's grace and power in our souls, in the mind and the will, it remains incomplete in this life. Which of us, which of you would say, I have a perfect intellect or I have a perfect will right now and right here at this point? None of us can say that. Our souls, though God has begun to transform them, the work of God in them remains incomplete in this life. But therefore, we ought to be comforted. It is a consolation and a joy to know that at the end of this life, there's something beyond a partial lifting up. There is a certain perfect and final lifting up of the soul. When the Christian dies, the soul is glorified or perfected, which means that our souls will become perfect in knowledge and wisdom. We will no longer struggle to distinguish truth from lies. At times, even when we sincerely want to believe and embrace the truth, we struggle to know what the truth is. We will not struggle to discern between good and evil. We will know everything that we need to know. There will be nothing lacking in our knowledge. We will be able to learn more, to, to go deeper, to 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 know better in terms of quality, to have a better quality of knowledge after death. And yet upon death, there will be no quantity of knowledge that we are missing that we need. There will be nothing that you need to know or that you ought to know, but you don't know. You will have everything. Your intellect will be perfected to know what you ought to know and to know it as you ought to know it. There will be no necessary knowledge that you are missing and mixed in with your knowledge, there will be no error, there will be no darkness, there will be no doubt. Even now we say, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. You won't have to say that. And not only your mind, not only will your intellect be perfected, but also your will the faculty of choice and decision and action. In the present, we choose to do evil at times. And we struggle to choose to do what is right. There is an irreconcilable war in us. But on that day when the will is perfected, there will be no more struggle. There will be no more battle. There will be no more fight. There will be no principle of sin and death remaining in us that does that which we know we ought not to do. That which I hate, I do, the Apostle Paul says. That won't happen anymore because our wills will be perfectly conformed to God and what he has commanded. And there will be no conflict, nor even a possibility of conflict, conflict between our actions or our wills and what God has commanded us to do. Because we'll, we, we will be in a, a state that is superior to that of Adam in the Garden of Eden. In the Garden of Eden, Adam was innocent and upright, holy and just but he was capable of falling from that innocence and that righteousness. His will was, was good and he had power to do what is right. And he was not inclined to do evil, but he was able to fall from that. And so when God perfects our wills, it will be a glory greater than Eden because we will not be able to fall away from our God forever and forever. So the soul consists of the intellect and the will, or the mind and the will. But when our souls move, there are motions of our souls, 
That's what we call the affections, or in modern language, emotions. So think about the affections of the soul or the, the motions of the soul. It's not complicated, but it sounds a little bit complicated. And you've heard it from me many times before. What are the motions of the soul? Well, the motions of the soul, the affections of the soul, are when you perceive something to be good and you're drawn to it or drawn to good, and you perceive something to be bad and you're repulsed by it. We're drawn to good and repulsed by evil. Those motions towards good or away from what you perceive to be bad, those motions are the affections of the soul. And for now, in this life, because of sin that muddles our knowledge and sin that affects our wills, our affections are misaligned. They're not properly sorted. They're not properly aligned so that we, we love and we are drawn to that which is truly bad, thinking it's good. Or we are repulsed by what is good, thinking that it is bad. Because the intellect fails to properly discern between good and bad and between right and wrong, therefore the will chooses in an incorrect way and we sin or we don't do what is right. So therefore, our happiness and our sadness, our anger and our delight, our love and our hate, these things are, are often misaligned and placed on the wrong things. But when our souls are perfected, and the intellect is perfected, and the will is perfected, you will always love that which is most worthy of love, God. And you will always rejoice at that which is truly the cause of joy, God. And you will always desire that which is truly deserving of desire, God. For now, we love and we delight and we desire in all kinds of things that are not God. Or we put them higher than God. That will no longer be the case. Sometimes you have sinful joy. Sometimes you have sinful despair. Sometimes you have sinful anger. Sometimes you have sinful love or sinful hate. Name any affection, and we are capable of, of being moved in a sinful way in that affection. And so in the things that we know and the things that we choose and all the motions of our souls that for now are so sinful, all of that will be purified and perfected. And we will live with perfect knowledge, with perfect obedience, perfect choices, in everlasting, perfect thankfulness, perfect joy, perfect delight, and perfect love to God. And brothers and sisters, that lifting up of our souls, that exaltation of our souls is certain, it is perfect, and it is final, and it awaits every Christian at the moment of their death. It's a promise and it's a true hope and it's what will take place immediately upon the death of the Christian. Jesus is the proof and the guarantee of our future glory. This is what awaits us when we die. Death is not some epic struggle for the Christian. Yes, it's a fight to die well, as in to reach the moment of death in a godly way. That is the Christian's fight. But death itself is not a fight. Jesus has already won that fight. Jesus has, al has already conquered that. We do not go into death and, and initiate some boss battle. <laughs> Jesus has won. Death for us is actually a, a portal to glory and bliss. And the soul is immediately perfected and the angels bring the soul to be in the presence of God. This is the exaltation and the perfection of the soul. But it's just the beginning of the lifting up of the Christian that Jesus has won for his people. Because Jesus has not just won a glory for the soul, Jesus has also won a glory and a perfection for the body, which is our second point. The second point is the perfection of the body. You may have heard of, you've probably heard in the church about the intermediate state, the intermediate state. Intermediate, in, in the middle, in between. When we die, 
we are souls separated from our bodies. Our bodies remain here and they, they corrode and dissolve uh, and they, they turn to dust. But the soul goes to be with the Lord. And that is an intermediate state. It is not the permanent or the, the final condition of man. And so what lies after the intermediate state? When Jesus Christ returns, when he comes again to this world on the day of the Lord, with his power and his voice, Jesus will summon the bodies of every single person who has ever lived, and he will raise them up. Jesus will raise up the wicked in bodies prepared for eternal torment, and Jesus will raise up the righteous who are righteous in Christ with bodies that are prepared for eternal blessedness. What will that body be like? The perfection of the body, what will it be like? Please turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Look at verse 42. Paul, in speaking of the resurrection of the dead, he says, picking up towards the middle of the verse, what is sown is perishable. He's going to give us, sorry, he's going to give us four characteristics or four attributes of the resurrected body. What is sown is perishable. What is raised is imperishable. It is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. It is sown a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. So we see here that the perfected body, the resurrected, glorified body, has four attributes. It is imperishable, it is glorious, it is powerful, and it is spiritual. What do these things mean? Let me briefly explain them to you. First, to be imperishable, an imperishable body means that it will not decay or die. It does not age or deteriorate. It can't be cut or crushed or broken or torn apart or disintegrated. Theologians sometimes speak of the impassibility of the resurrected body. It's not susceptible to suffering. It can't be harmed. It can't be torn to pieces. It can't decompose. It is imperishable, incapable of being destroyed. You cannot corrupt it. You cannot inject something in it that then begins to disintegrate it. It is imperishable, not subject to decay, destruction, or decomposition. It is an uncursed body. It is glorious. What does it mean to be glorious? Well, it means to have the beauty of nature that God designed for it. It is as beautiful as God makes it. <laughs> now, we admire beauty in God's creation, don't we? We admire beauty in nature. We look at the mountains. We look at the ocean. We look at the moon above all. And we're fascinated by that natural beauty. We're also fascinated by the beauty of the human body, both male and female. God has made the human body to be beautiful. It's not just its outward form, which is indeed beautiful, but its function. When you study anatomy and everything about the body, there is a beauty. There is a glory of the body. There is a glory of the, the natural world that God has made and Paul is telling us that the beauty and glory of the resurrected body will excel. It will be far beyond the beauty of the current bodies that we know. Paul speaks about stars that differ from stars in glory. And this body, if it has a glory in its corruptible mortal state, that body will have a glory in its incorruptible immortal state. An even greater beauty. Now we think of glory in terms of visible brightness. Will that body have some kind of visible brightness? 
that, that could be the case. Heavenly beings are often associated with a celestial light of sorts. It's not something that I could declare dogmatically, but it will have a beauty. <laughs> it will have a glory. It is also powerful. The perfected body is powerful, which means that you will be able to do with that body anything that God has designed you to do. Your body will never be the thing that holds you back. Our present bodies get tired and they weaken. You decide to start working out and for the first 20 seconds you think, wow, this is easy, I can do this. And then the next 20 seconds you think, "Uh uh-oh. And then after the first minute, you're done because you just started working out. And you have to develop your energy. You have to develop your stamina and your strength to, to run or to do any, any kind of exercise, those bodies will not get tired or weaken. They will be powerful. They will be sufficiently capable and powerful to do everything that God has called you to do and that you ought to do without any of the fatigue or any of the weakness that we experience now. If you're meant to do it, you'll be able to do it. Your body will be powerful. Now, each and every one of us Uh, I look at the congregation and I see various points of decay and deterioration. Each one of us is at a different phase and a different state of decay. Some are more wrinkly and white than others. Some are more fresh, uh, although maybe it's just makeup, right? Uh, Some are more fresh. Some are saying, ooh, ow. Some are saying, woohoo, and wow. Uh, But even those who for now have who have a youth and vitality, they too one day will be the hobbled, cane-tapping old miser if the Lord gives them the years. Every single one of us, no matter where we are, we live in a mortal body. But that body will be powerful. It will also be spiritual. What does it mean for the body to be spiritual? This is perhaps one of the least understood characteristics of the resurrected body. You have to understand it by contrast to the the animal body that we currently have. Our current bodies are animated, they they are given life and vitality by the natural world around us. For now, we need to use things around us to fuel and maintain this body. It's not complicated. If you stop eating, what happens? Your body loses all of its energy and you die. If you don't give the body tacos, you'll die. You must eat the tacos. And indeed, my body tells me at at noon, hey, it's time for lunch. Your Your body constantly reminds you, you need to eat, you need to eat, you need to eat because your body is animated, it's it's given power and strength and vitality by the world around you. But Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15 that flesh and blood do not inherit the kingdom of God. Flesh and blood are perishable and weak, and flesh and blood are the natural body. But we, in the resurrected perfect body, will have a self-sustaining life force in the same way that spirits do. He's not saying that we will be spirits. The body is a body, a material body, but it has a life like the spirits, a spiritual body. Spirits do not need to eat and to drink to live. Spirits do not need to use the world around them to fuel and maintain their life force. And so also the resurrected body will be spiritual in the sense that it won't need anything from nature to keep itself alive. It will have its own self-sustaining existence and life force. Of course, granted and given by God, but granted and given in such a way that it doesn't need to be sustained by something else. It has its own livelihood or liveliness. And if you add up these four qualities, they constitute immortality or eternal life. And this is the lifting up of the body the exaltation and the glory and the perfection of the body. But to be like that, what is truly wonderful about it is that in so being, we will be like Jesus Christ himself. 
he has already, he is the one and only human that has entered into the glory of the perfected and resurrected humanity. He is the one. And we will be just like him. As is he, so will I be. We will become everything that God created humans to be. And we will reach the sum of human existence in body and soul and do so in the image of God the Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Think about your souls and your bodies, brothers and sisters, and receive this consolation from God. Do you suffer from mental illness or just mental weakness? Do you have paranoia or anxiety or dissociation? God will lift you up. Do you have post-traumatic stress and depression and fear? God will lift you up. Do you struggle to understand things like the scriptures? Do you struggle to remember things like the scriptures? Is your faith mingled with doubt and your courage mingled with fear? God will lift you up. Do you have poor hearing or poor eyesight? God will lift you up. Do you have painful knees? or partially amputated feet, you will be lifted up. Do your shoulders hurt? Does your back hurt? You will be lifted up. Do your hands ache with arthritis and you have migraines and stomach issues? God will lift you up. Do you suffer from a lack of sleep or a chronic illness? God will lift you up. Do you have a transplanted heart or do you have cancer? God will lift you up. You see at the end of life, there is a certain and a perfect and a final lifting up, first of the soul and then of the body on that great day. Do you believe that? If you believe in Jesus, then you believe in that because that's what Jesus has done and won for us. And believing in him is nothing other than believing in this lifting up, which he himself promised. All that the Father has given me on the last day, I will raise them up. He is the source and the end, the author and finisher. He suffered and entered into glory, and we too must suffer and then enter into the very same glory that Jesus has won for us. And our duty until that time is to humble ourselves under God's mighty hand. Can we do that? Can we humble ourselves under his mighty hand? Yes, we can with his help and his power, but also, yes, we can when we set our hearts, our affections on that sure and certain lifting up that awaits us in both soul and body. So let the certainty and the perfection and the finality of your lifting up encourage you and motivate you and comfort you and cheer you. As Jesus said, do not be afraid, I have overcome the world. And Peter says, at the proper time, he will exalt you. Thirdly, the perfection of creation where will these perfected humans live? <laughs> Where are you going to put these perfected humans? Jesus has won a glory for creation also. And we as perfect humans will inhabit a perfect new creation. In 2 Peter chapter 3, Peter talks about this world dissolving and being burned up, the elements being disintegrated. And then he says in verse 13 of chapter 3, we are waiting for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. And then Paul in Romans chapter 8, he speaks about creation itself being subject to futility and that creation also will be freed from its bondage to corruption, he says, when the children of God are glorified. When we enter into our perfection, so also creation will enter into its perfection. And the scriptures teach us that eternal life is not some immaterial existence, nor is it being baby cherubs with harps on clouds. Rather, eternal life is enjoying God's creation to the fullest as he intended it for his creatures, for his people. So creation will be perfected in such a way that not only will there be no dangers for us, no threats, but perhaps most of all, perfection, creation will be perfected in the sense that we will be able to enjoy it to the fullest degree. We will, we will be able to know it and to reach it or, or do things to the maximum extent 
for which God has made it for our sake. We look at the depths of the sea and we say, it's so difficult to get there. We have to protect our very lives to explore it. We look at the vastness of the universe around us and we say, could we, how far could we possibly get? And there's so many limitations of weakness and knowledge as well as mortality that keep us from fully enjoying and appreciating the depth and the infinity of God's creation. But that creation will be perfected and we also in it such that we will be able to reach the highest heights and the deepest depths if God has designed them for us to reach them. There will be nothing that we long to know and see that we will be not be able that we will not be able to know and see if God has designed us to, to be able to know and see it. We will enjoy the fullness of creation as far as God has designed us to, to enjoy it. For now, when man spreads throughout the created world, we spread the curse with us, don't we? And man goes to to the natural world, whether here on this planet or, or as we look outside of ours. And they say, wow, isn't evolution so amazing? Or, you know, the, the Big Bang made all this and such things. And it, it's, it's pardon the, the term, it's insanity to think this way. But for us, as we learn more and more about creation, it's more and more, wow, the intricacy and complexity of God's design, the intricacy and the beauty of God's creation. Uh, our enjoyment of creation will simply cause a, a resounding it will cause a, a symphony that echoes back to God of his glory again and again and again. Am I saying that there will be flora and fauna, plant and animal life? Well, it would certainly seem so. It's a, a new creation. And what does Jesus say about the fruit of the vine and when he will drink it again with us? He says, in my father's kingdom. Souls don't drink things, so it's not the intermediate state. And it's in my Father's kingdom. It's when all things are brought to consummation. Then Jesus says, we're drinking wine. <laughs> if there is wine, there are grapes. If there are grapes, they have been crushed to make wine. I'll just let you think about that. Okay, so if there is wine, then there are grapes. If there are grapes, then there are ecosystems. If there are ecosystems, then it's a new creation, but it's perfected. And we're able to enjoy it unto the glory of God. We will eat and drink, not for survival. Body doesn't need it. And not with sin, not with gluttony or drunkenness. You wouldn't want that. But to the glory of God who gives us good things just for us to enjoy them and say thank you and praise you for the good things that you make and the wonderful things that you give us to enjoy out of the abundance of your goodness. We being perfect will inhabit a perfected creation to the fullest extent and all to the glory of God without any sin, sorrow, or suffering. This brings us, fourthly and finally, to the perfection of communion. Our lifting up just gets better and better. The perfection of the body and the soul is amazing. The perfection of creation is wonderful. But there's an ultimate lifting up, a consummate lifting up, a lifting up that's so high that none can be higher. What is that highest of heights, that supreme blessing that awaits God's people? What is the sum and the summit of the glory that Jesus has won for us? I hope you already know the answer. It's God himself and communion with him. What is the source of true joy, rejoicing, and enjoyment for mankind? What is man's chief end? To glorify God and what? To enjoy him forever. God's greatest gift to us, the supreme blessing of eternal life, is God himself. Throughout the scriptures, God dwells with his people as a holy God in holy places, in Eden, in the tabernacle, in the temple, in the believer, in the church. God is pure, so the place must be pure and the people must be pure. Well, we've seen the perfection of the people and the perfection of the place, the new creation. And so what is it like to dwell with God perfected and in a perfect creation? Well, it's perfect communion. And we can see what this will look like in, 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 in the greatest language that can be used as far as we can know it now, 
in Revelation 21 and 22. Please turn to Revelation 21. When we read these descriptions of glory and majesty and beauty, do not hear me in any way saying, it won't be like that. Rather, what we're saying is, it will be as grand as you can imagine it, only even better. <laughs> because this is a future glory described in the language of present perception and knowledge. So allow the fullness of the beauty and the majesty to impact you and then think it's even better than however you imagine that, to perceive that to be. But I want to emphasize the perfection of communion. Revelation 21, verses 1 through 5. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more, for the former things have passed away. And he who is seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Also, he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. Skip down to verse 22. And I saw no temple in the city, for its temple is the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb. Why is there no temple? Because there's no distinction between the holy place and the unholy place, or the, the most holy place and the holy place and the unholy place. There's no insanctity. I don't think that's a word. There's no unholiness. The entire creation is a sanctuary, and God fills it with his presence, which means there's, there's no place that I'm here, but God's not here with me. There, there's no more temple, not temple. There's no more sanctuary, not sanctuary. It's perfect communion because it's a perfect people and a perfect creation. And as the new Jerusalem descends, there's no more gods in heaven and we're on earth. It's all one perfected place where there is perfect communion with God. And he, with man, is their source of delight and joy and awe forever and ever and ever. Nor will there be, nor could there be, anything sinful, unholy, or unrighteous that would ever disrupt or distort the perfection of this communion for all eternity. And yet even this does not sufficiently communicate our communion with God there. We must turn to chapter 22. Verses 1 through 5. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb, through the middle of the street of the city, also on either side of the river the tree of life, with its twelve kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be anything accursed, but the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and his servants will worship him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads, and night will be no more. They will need no light of lamp or sun, for the Lord God will be their light, and they will reign forever and ever. I want you to notice with me in verse 1, the throne of God and of the Lamb. Where is Jesus seated? At the right hand of God, or as Hebrews calls it, at the right hand of the majesty on high. There is the glory of God and Jesus in his resurrected human body seated beside it. And this is mentioned again in verse 3. The throne of God and of the Lamb. In verse 4, we are told, they will see his face. This is the perfection of communion with God. To see the face of God. But is this not to see the face of our exalted Savior? Yes, it most certainly is, but it's more than that. 
without taking away from that in any way, shape, or form. We add to that, not just the throne of the Lamb, but the throne of God, which we see face to face, and we will see God in a way that no mortal man can. No one can see God and live. And he is invisible to man, not by virtue of obscurity, too dark, but by virtue of brilliance, too bright. And the angels are said to see the face of God. And Paul says, for now we see through a glass darkly, but then we will see face to face. And so with a perfected soul and with a perfected body, in the perfection of creation, we will enjoy the perfection of communion, which is to see God with a perfected soul and a perfected knowledge and will and affections and a perfected body with perfect ability and enjoyment. And in seeing God, we see the source and the sum of all goodness and blessedness, the sum and the source of all being itself, the sum and the source of all that is, I am that I am. We will see God. That is the vision of the soul and the body that will satisfy and delight us forever and ever and ever. Our ultimate lifting up, the exaltation of all exaltations, the sum and the summit of perfection and consummation and glory is to be like and to be with our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, our God in the flesh, and thus perfected in his glory to behold the divine glory. We will see God in his human glory, Jesus Christ, and we will behold the divine glory, the unfiltered, unhidden, incomprehensibly and ineffably beautiful glory and majesty of God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And there is no human eloquence that can describe this blessing on this side of life and prior to that consummation. And yet, as unspeakably and inutterably wonderful as this is, it is our lifting up. This is the glory that Jesus has won for us. And because God himself is our portion and perfected communion with him is our inheritance, therefore there is no higher height. There is no better thing. There's nothing more good. There's nothing better than goodness itself. To be given the vision and enjoyment of God forever and ever is eternal life itself, as Jesus himself said. And this is eternal life, to know the one true God and Jesus Christ whom he has sent. And we will know the one true God and Jesus Christ whom he has sent as we behold God's glory in our flesh or us in his flesh and as we behold his divine glory. He said to me these words, are trustworthy and true. Brothers and sisters, this is what we set our hearts on. This is what we set our hope on. This is the lifting up of the Christian that Jesus Christ has won for every single one of us. Brothers and sisters, humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on him, because he cares for you. Are you excited? Are you anticipating? <laughs> it's, it's coming. <laughs> Jesus has entered into it. He is making all things new. It is sure and certain. And because of this, brothers and sisters, we are able to endure those afflictions that God sends or permits, knowing they're all preparatory, knowing they're preparing us for this, knowing that they all lead to it, and therefore, we ought to humble ourselves and not say, God, why? God, why? Remove this. But say, there's a glory coming. There's a glory coming for my mind that's troubled, for my body that's painful, for this world that's falling to pieces, for all of it. And the sum and the summit, the source and the end, the alpha and omega, is perfect communion with my God himself. And I long for that day, and I wait for that day, and I rejoice in that day. And every first day of the week, I remember that coming day, because Jesus has risen from the dead.
Praise be to God. Let's pray. Our great and glorious, merciful, mighty, and majestic God, how we praise you and we thank you for all that you have done for us. In your Son, Jesus Christ. And Jesus, our great love and head and husband, our Savior and our King, we thank you that you took our flesh upon yourself to rescue us from our misery, to free us from our condemnation. And you have given, you have obtained a new body, and we will be in your flesh, in your body, because of that. Holy Spirit, we thank you, our great God, that you have initiated this work in our souls, that you have begun the lifting up of Jesus' people through regeneration, and you are continuing it through sanctification and preservation. You remind us of our adoption, that we are the sons of God, and that we have an inheritance, an incorruptible inheritance. We thank you, our great God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit for our salvation, which prepares us to have perfect communion with you. We pray that you would enable us to humble ourselves under your mighty hand so that at the proper time, you will exalt us. And we pray this in Jesus' name.